So there's really three things I want to cover. The first is some recent trends in the water market in the southern Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, the second is I'll provide an overview of the results of some work that we've done, which highlights the changes in demand for water in the southern Murray-Darling Basin. And then last, I'll try and bring all that together and explain how it's affected water market outcomes in the southern Murray-Darling Basin. So first to uh, allocation trade in the southern basin. Uh, so we can see here that uh, allocation trade has generally increased over time. Uh, and we've seen prices have fluctuated, and they fluctuate mainly in response to how much water is available. So prices are quite low, obviously, when there's lots of rainfall around. So in the last, uh, you know, about five or six years ago, there's quite a lot of rain and quite a lot of water around. Uh, so um, uh, prices were quite low. In terms of entitlement trade, now entitlement trade is different to allocation trade in that allocation trade is where entitlement holders just lease out their water under their entitlement for a particular year, whereas entitlement trade is where they uh, sell the actual entitlement permanently to somebody else. So entitlement trade itself has fluctuated quite a lot. Uh, interestingly, prices in about the last five years are on an increasing trend. I'll now run through how some of the changes in uh, water use have occurred in the southern part of the basin. And first is one of the pretty well documented uh, changes that a lot of people have probably heard of, and it's, it's changes to nut production and nut water use in the southern part of the basin. So we can see here uh, uh, water used on nut farms in the lower uh, Murray, re lower Victorian Murray region has increased rapidly in the last five to, to eight years, whereas water use on all other farms in that part of the world has stayed pretty constant. Similarly, uh, cotton uh, area, area planted in the Murrumbidgee has increased a lot uh, in, in the last five or ten years, and this has been largely the result of uh, the development of new varieties of cotton that, that has meant that cotton can be grown in the southern part of the basin where the seasons are a little bit shorter. Now, rice production is interesting. Rice production tends to go up and down quite a lot, and it's highly dependent on the amount of water available. So when there's lots of water available and prices are, are low, uh, there's a fair amount of rice grown and, and vice versa. Now, having a look at uh, trade in the, in the southern basin, the, the southern uh, Murray-Darling Basin is a connected system, so you can trade water uh, around the place. And what I've got here is uh, the net trade that's happening in the basin in the last few years. So red areas is where there's net trade out of those regions, and blue, we've got net trade into those areas. So in general, as you can tell from the, the map here, that water is moving out of the New South Wales Murray and the New South Wales uh, Murrumbidgee area and, and moving into the Victorian Lower Murray area. Um, I suppose the other thing to note here is that uh, the, the, the movement of water can have important implications for the future because we are seeing um, some trade restrictions become more binding over time. So while it is a connected system, there are hydrological reasons why there are tr trade restrictions in the basin, uh, and we're expecting that under a future scenario of uh, drying and more variable climate, uh, with all the also the, the, the nuts and, and uh, cotton going in different areas of the basin, these trade restrictions are likely to be more of an issue in, in the future. Oops, sorry, I've got one more thing to say here. The, the other implication of these trade restrictions is that it can result in uh, differences in prices in the, in the regions in the southern basin. So the Murrumbidgee is a good example of that. Uh, last year, most of the year, trade was not allowed out of the Murrumbidgee. There was a trade restriction in place. And we saw there that the price allocation price for water in the Murrumbidgee was about $20 a megalitre lower than the rest of the basin. And that's simply because uh, there's less demand, because there's no demand downstream for the water able to get that, that water. What we've uh, developed is a, a water trade model, and I won't go into the uh, technical details of that, but effectively it's a model of water trade in the southern basin, and the value of that is that we can hold things constant and uh, run scenarios where we change one or more things to see what the implications of those things are on, on the water market. So I'll now run through some, some of those um, scenarios we've had a look at. So one, one bit of analysis we did, we held water prices constant at uh, $100 per, per megalitre and under an assumption of average seasonal conditions, uh, we looked at how the quantity of water demanded uh, changed and, and this is a change between 2003 and 2017. And uh, picking up some reasonably obvious things here that are probably fairly well documented, so there's a reduction in the demand for uh, water used on pastures and that's mainly for, uh, for dairy. 
uh, and, and also for rice. And there's been an increase in the demand for water on uh, for fruit and nuts, and that makes sense with the almond plantings going in, and also cotton. Um, the reason for these changes, the main driver is simply just a change in the area of production. Uh, so there's obviously a lot less dairying going on in northern Victoria now compared to 2003, uh, and, and more cotton happening. But there will be some changes in water use efficiency occurring through time here. But the overwhelming driver for this is just changes in the uh, amount of these different commodities grown. So sticking with the same scenario, but uh, looking at the results by, by region rather than commodity, uh, we see that overall, uh, same story, lower demand overall for water in the Southern Basin, uh, and that there are regional differences. So uh, Murrumbidgee, for example, is a, a good example where we've seen water uh, move out, less demand for water in the Murrumbidgee, and that's driven by um, you know, the reduction in demand for rice. Uh, but there's also the increase in demand for cotton. So it's an interesting example where uh, there's still overall a net reduction in water demand. And the Victoria Murray below Obama, uh, again, that goes back to the nut production story. So uh, I'll have a discussion now about uh, one of the main changes in how water is managed in the Southern Basin, and that's carryover. So for those that don't know, carryover is a, um, it's a rule where uh, unused water entitlement holders can carry that water over into the following year. Uh, and what we've seen over the last probably 15 years or so, there's various changes to the rules about how carryover is, is managed. But in general, it's made carryover more available, more possible. Uh, and farmers are getting more used to how to use carryover to, to maximise the benefit. So what we we can see here is that for similar levels of rainfall uh, in the more recent period since 2007, there are much higher levels of carryover. So what this does is has the effect of smoothing out prices through time because uh, irrigators have more flexibility with their water use. So now what I'll attempt to do is bring uh, together how all these things might have actually affected allocation prices. So in our model, uh, what, what we do is we apply a bunch of today's conditions and we apply it back through time to see how prices would be different. So what I've got up here is just the historical allocation prices. So it's the baseline that we compare uh, the, future, the other scenarios to. And, and those things that we uh, apply back through time, they're the four things I've got listed there. We've, we've applied today's demand to the whole historical period. Uh, today's trade limits, uh, water recovery and um, carryover back through time. So first I've got here a scenario that has three of those included in the, in the chart uh, and that's today's demand, trade limits and water recovery under the basin plan. So this is purchases under the basin plan. And what we can see here is that in general prices are, uh, the model is telling us, are higher through the historical period and that makes, that makes some sense. Uh, but at the peak of the drought in 2007-08, our model is telling us that prices would be about $50 a megalitre higher. Now, uh, this is a bit of a surprise to some people because some people would have you believe that um, a rerun of the drought in that particular peak uh, year of the drought, prices would be much, much higher uh, than, than what happened historically. And the reasons given are, well, there's all the water recovered under the basin plan uh, and there's all these nuts have been planted. But what we conclude here is that that, that change in profile of, of water demand has actually had a, a tempering effect uh, on prices, which is, is limiting the increase in, in the prices. So another scenario that we, we added to, we thought, okay, what, what's the impact of carryover? What's carryover done to water prices in, in the Southern Basin? So we've added carryover here. So today's carryover rules, again, applied back through time. And you see the period around 2004, five, what happens is entitlement holders build up their carryover reserves. So this has the implication of increasing prices slightly as they're building up their reserves. But then when the peak of the drought hits, they draw down on those carryover reserves. And again, that has a, a tempering effect uh, on prices. So conclusion from this is that the prices would be around about the same level if we had a rerun of, of uh, that drought. Um, so that's an inter interesting result. So uh, we'll probably have some more discussion about that a little later on. I thought I'd finish with a slide here on um, uh, transparency of water prices uh, and, and price discovery in the basin. So what I've got here is a chart of all transactions. So each dot is a transaction in the, in the southern basin between the period 2008 and, and now. And you can see, yes, there is a, a reasonably tight distribution of dots around the average, um, but there's a lot of variation there. So there's a whole pile of dots that are way away from uh, the average. 
you think, well, this is a bit odd. Uh, you know, in a market that had perfect information and data collected uh, very well, you'd expect individuals to be paying the same price at, at the same time. Uh, so it's likely we've got a bit of an issue here with data collection. You know, the state registers, there are some issues with data collection there. But it could also be that some people in the market are having trouble understanding what, uh, pro what the going price is. It's, it's probably a combination of both. A and the other thing to add to this is that not all entitlements in the Southern Basin are the same. So there are some differences in characteristics which could also help explain uh, some of the variability. So I guess I'd, I'll finish on a point uh, which, again, hopefully we discuss more in, in detail in the session we're about to have, but, you know, there's a role here potentially for government to have a look at uh, information provision in, in the market, but, but there's presumably a line there where the government uh, has a role only so far and then at some point the private sector um, could take over in terms of providing information for the market. So hopefully we talk about that and lots of other things in the session. So that's, that's me. Thank you. Thank you.